So plan A was to kick off the brand new year by chatting about Jules Verne with you nice folks. But for reasons that would take time to explain, I ran into a couple of minor setbacks. And it turns out that it is more comically significant that plan A has in fact morphed into plan C. Citations, fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and I would like to use the androgynous sounds of my voice to share with you a few words about... 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, first published between 1869 and 1870, and written by renowned pioneer of science fiction Jules Verne. If by chance you are unfamiliar with the story, it is one in which during an era when boats were the method by which people crossed the ocean, an unidentified floating object is sighted off a multitude of port bows, sinks a couple of ships, and is presumed to be a sea monster of incredible size. And because sea monsters are hell on insurance rates, a ship called the Abraham Lincoln sets sail from New York, on behalf of the American government, with the straightforward mission of killing that monster. Included on the Abraham Lincoln's roster of monster hunters are Professor Aranax, a French naturalist with a keen interest in marine life, his servant Conceal, and expert harpooner Ned Land. After months of false alarms at sea, Ned spots the monster's incandescent glow off the coast of Japan, and a merry chase ensues at the end of which the monster takes out the Abraham Lincoln's rudder, leaving her afloat but unable to change directions. Ned, Conceal, and the Professor, for one reason or another, get thrown from the ship and marooned on top of the monster, which turns out to be a 230-foot-long submarine called the Nautilus. The captain of the submarine, who calls himself Nemo, a Latin word meaning no one, offers the castaways a choice of expedient death or an undersea voyage of indefinite length, a prospect about which some of them are more happy than others. We don't want none of his gratitude! We don't want none of his gratitude! As far as adaptations go, the Disney studio may still be the prize taker for Nautilus that is sharpest looking and most book accurate, because while not, quote, cigar shaped, unquote, as described by Jules Verne, it does have scale like armored plates, unlike the Nautilus from, say, the ancient silent film, which looks like someone hit the jackpot at the Army Navy surplus store. And the special effects crowd at Disney clearly put a lot of thought into how much Nemo's ship should look like an IRL submarine, versus how much it should look like a creature, versus how much it should look like a tank. If by chance you were trying to BS a book report on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea based on movie knowledge alone, first of all, don't. The book is surprisingly theme-heavy, and almost none of those themes made it into any movie adaptation I've thus far seen. Second of all, Disney movie knowledge alone still beats the daylights out of Hallmark Channel movie knowledge alone, since, among other things, this version replaces Conceal with a sexy lady, and gives her a love triangle between Ned and Nemo. Well, I would not presume to tell you not to watch this one. The top review on IMDb leads with, The book was 20,000 times better. And in all generosity, that is a lowball estimate. Nevertheless, were I to try to bluff a semi-convincing book report strictly on Disney knowledge alone, I might watch the old movie to right about here, then track down the footage of the now-extinct theme park ride, because they actually covered stuff from the book that got cut from the movie, such as Nemo's trip to the Antarctic and the volcanoes of Atlantis. Others treat any concept of Atlantis as pure fantasy, along with legends of sea serpents and mermaids. By far the sharpest looking Captain Nemo is the one in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but if by chance you are concerned that the choice to make him Indian here means he has been whitewashed in other versions, not exactly. Professor Aranax describes Nemo as tall and pale, with a pointed nose, broad forehead, and intense eyes. Readers of Jules Verne at the time he was writing about Captain Nemo would not learn that he was an Indian prince until Mysterious Island, the lesser-known sequel to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, published five years later. And I would argue Nemo's character is strongest when we don't know his backstory or country of birth, because he is brilliant. He is pig-headed, he is hypocritical, he is relentless. His crew and he are collective examples of everything mankind can be, good and bad. So Nemo, as his chosen name would suggest, is in fact no one and also everyone who rages in vain against the powers that be, whether those powers take the form of God, government, or forces of nature. And despite the loving relationship Nemo thinks he has with the sea, he is first and foremost an imperialist. For example, he will spend long, uninterrupted paragraphs bemoaning how wantonly destructive mankind is on land, then ransack the sea for his own personal amusement. Like, he considers what Ned Land does on whaling vessels to be grotesque and needless slaughter, right? Cool. But on the same page he chews Ned out for his vocation-related bloodlust, 
Nemo massacres an entire pod of sperm whales with the prow of his submarine because he has decided they are evil killing machines. That's kind of the ink calling the squid black there, my friend. And like all great imperialists, Nemo even has his own flag that he has no problem planting on portions of the globe that quote no one unquote has put their names on yet. You just sail around the world and stick a flag in. In case you're curious, Nemo's flag is black with a big gold N on it, and he uses it to claim the South Pole as his own, despite the fact that he has sworn many, many times never to set foot on land, but ice doesn't count, I guess. And it was right around here, in the typing of my script, that literature brain kicked in for realsies, and I heard it say, Oh, I get it. That's why Captain Nemo and Ned land don't get along, because Nemo hates land, and personification is a literary device that authors use from time to time with varying degrees of subtlety. Thanks, Mr. Vern. I'm not mad that you wrote it, I'm mad that it took me this long to see it. Anyway, the biggest departure from the book as far as the Disney crowd is concerned is that Captain Nemo lives and dies thinking mankind is his enemy. See, Disney has warmed up to the concept of imperfect heroes over the years, but it remains mildly allergic to villains who threaten to take up more than their allotted spoonful of abstract symbolism and unanswered questions. In the case of this movie, they opt to get rid of Nemo's dueling themes, which pretty fluidly bounce between man versus man, man versus nature, and man versus self in the book, and pare it down to a story that is strictly man versus man, giving Nemo a single war-prone country that is his principal nemesis. And you know they're evil because they have no flag. Do you have a flag? No flag, sir. No flag, no country. You can't have one. So at the climax of the 1954 picture, the Disney crowd allows Nemo to get shot by these flagless heathens and his crew do what any level-headed crew with a dying captain would do. They sink their ship with all hands aboard, except our three main characters who fight their way out, and the crew of the Nautilus just kind of waits to suffocate in their monster-shaped mausoleum. Um, Disney? Are you sure this is the cuddlier, less complicated version of the story? Because you succeeded in making a strong villain without a bunch of messy symbols into one pack, and also in making an ending that was way darker than the book. Meanwhile, in literature land, a lot of potentially deadly mishaps befall the bookbound Nautilus in the course of her 20,000 league voyage. And Nemo doesn't consciously realize it, but he frequently makes excuses for why these mishaps are not the sea's fault, to the point that he unwittingly mirrors the behavior of one who is in an unhealthy codependent relationship. It's not the sea's fault that we got stranded on the rocks, or that we all nearly froze to death in the Antarctic, or that our self-imposed isolation from things like emergency medical care keeps killing us unnecessarily in our little underwater refuge. But when giant squids attack the Nautilus and kill one of Nemo's own, he kind of implodes emotionally. It's not outright stated in the book, and he's not the kind of guy who talks about his feelings. But I get the impression that Nemo takes the death of his comrade in the metaphorical arms of the sea as a personal betrayal. Like, that's it. The sea was my last hope for a worthwhile life, and now I can't trust her. Was my love affair with her one-sided all along? What even worse thing might she do to me next time? Not that I've ever felt that way toward an untrue lover. Eventually, the captain stops paying as careful attention to the headings of the Nautilus as he once did, and accidentally or on purpose, lets her drift toward Norway and the Maelstrom. The professor and his two buddies head for the lifeboat and watch the Nautilus sink from a distance, but she's a submarine, so they can't say for sure whether she is or is not gone forever, which makes the existence of Mysterious Island kind of frustrating for me, because I don't care how much delicious Patrick Stewart you smear on top of this stink burger, the unsettling lack of closure from the first book not knowing whether the Nautilus and her crew were lost in the depths with their aimless captain, work as an incredible cautionary tale against hubris, infatuation, untreated depression, and unquestioned authority. But a mysterious island we learn, uh, spoilers, Nemo's fine, and Indian, and killing the remainder of his dwindling days on planet Earth punning pirates or something. Mr. Vern? Dear Mr. Vern, I am sorry that adequate medical care was not available for you, at such time as you were suffering from stage 4 sequelitis, and I wish you would have been less inclined to take it out on your readers. Nevertheless, I truly believe that 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea was and is a net positive for fiction, and perhaps the world. As Ray Bradbury once wrote about the effects this one book had on its readers over the years, we not only did, but read, and having read, did more. And all told, inspiring readers to do more as a result of having read your work is just about the most powerful impression on terra firma any fiction writer can hope to leave. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot, I post whenever I can. If you liked this video, please consider giving this one a try. Until we meet again, take it easy. Loves you.